it. Wait, it tells me. Okay, it's recording. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Larry, for agreeing to give a Bilbiso seminar. And you can get started. Okay. Well, thank you, Kate. And yeah, thanks for the invitation. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Um, this, I think this is a community that I, I can kind of connect with in a, in a way of doing... Um, you know, having cells do things that they don't normally do, right? So, um, so you can see from the you know the title that I'm working on these uh, fluorinated compounds and how they interface with with um, living living cells. So, I'm in the department of biochemistry. I'm also connected to the biotechnology institute at the the University of Minnesota, and so you know I'm not out to create a cell de novo. But rather, as I said, to to sort of see how cells interface with um, an element that that really biology has has largely um, ignored, and so I've long been interested in um, uh, how microbes respond to new industrial chemicals, and so there's you know some just the, in the middle is the database that we created. It's now. Um, being maintained and um, expanded at in, in Zurich, Switzerland by Catherine Fenner. Um, but we, we really start, Linda Ellis and I started this uh, quite some time ago, where we were looking at not your um, textbook uh, biochemical enzyme reactions and metabolism, but rather at um, uh, how uh, microbes respond to new chemicals. And although some of these may look somewhat exotic. I mean, they're not things you're going to find on your biochemical wall chart or um, in in most databases of uh, general metabolism. But um, in fact, uh, a lot of them or a number of them are natural products or, or closely resemble natural products. So um, basically living things make trisulfides and uh, sulfenic acids and selenophosphates um, and and elaborate uh, with, uh, molecules with um, bromine chlorine and, and make phosphonic acids. So so these are are many of them are, are naturally occurring functional groups. Now what I'm going to talk about today really is exotic. It really is different. It it really is. They are industrial chemicals that. Um, are are new to the to the biosphere, and of course that imposes new challenges, both um, uh, in, environmentally in terms of their fate in the environment that has a lot of people concerned, but also uh, with respect to, well, how are living things going to interact with them? And can we do something about that? Can we use synthetic biology to maybe deal with some of the problems that have, that have emanated from use of, of some of these uh, chemicals? So um, in fact, uh, because these chemicals are uh, completely different than what nature has seen. They, uh, many environments, people are seeing them where they're not going away. And this has led to the moniker of forever chemicals. And um, this has become really widespread. I mean, even, uh, you know, the, the comedy host, uh, Trevor Noah, even uh, found a segment to deal with it on his show. So everywhere you see forever chemicals, forever chemicals. And... <clears throat> I mean, this this is really you know supporting the idea that that yes, they're they're not readily degradable in the environment, and and so that makes them a problem. The, the, these chemicals that are industrial, and I'll show you some few examples of those in just a moment. But but first, um, you know, I just want to say that you know when I looked at this or or really got uh, involved in this a few years ago, um, you know. I, I, when I, it sort of bothered me that that this forever moniker, because you, you know it's it's not a testable hypothesis. It's not scientific just to say that uh, well, uh, you know we we see uh, these levels are not going down last year, so they're going to be around with us forever. 
It's not a testable hypothesis. So, so what what are the problems? You know, that's what we wanted to know. Like, what are the the issues in in cells interacting with these, and what are the problems, and are there things we can do about some of the specific, specific problems by by investigating it um, more deeply? So, first of all, what about biology and fluorine? Like, uh, you know, I've said they're they're exotic, but but what does that what does that mean? All right, so first of all, it th this really surprised me. You know, I hadn't worked on on fluorine uh, be before a few years ago, and when I looked into actually the pre prevalence of fluorine, I was really um, surprised that fluorine is more abundant in the Earth's crust than sulfur, carbon, and nitrogen. And of course, you know, C, N, and S are are very abundant in in cells. Um, but but uh, looking into this, um, this paper uh, from about 10 years ago, they they took a, a number of dozens of bacteria, they they ashed them, they looked at the elemental content, and they looked at the top 33. And fluorine did not come in the top 33. So it was less than lead and and arsenic and selenium and 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 other other cadmium, right? So these are elements we think of as a biological toxic heavy metals um and and fluorine it's less than than present in those and we'll get into late a little bit later about why that is but this really shows that biology ignores or avoids fluorine right so that's that's uh number one and so humans found this out too in a in a in some ways a terrible way um, in the beginning days of fluorine chemistry. Um, I'm going to share with you actually this top part of this slide. The next slide is uh, comes from a Facebook post that was anonymous and, and um, it's, it's really uh, telling. So this is how the start of fluorine chemistry at the top. These are some names you've probably heard of, uh, 19th century chemists, um, who who actually worked with with fluorine and fluorinated uh, worked on making fluorinated compounds and handling fluorine and fluorine compounds, and um, they're called the martyrs because you can see the birth and de death dates that were posted, um, and some of them didn't live very long. And and looking into this, in fact, they did die from um, complications deep from fluorine fluorine, fluorine toxicity. Uh, that accumulated over years. So this was, um, you know, a terrible way to learn about fluorine and its um, toxic properties. But then, you know, through through their efforts and others, um, uh, chemistry chemists did learn how to work with fluorine and and basically keep away from it um, in the process of making organofluorine compounds. And that led to the 20th century, which I calling here the golden age of organofluorine chemistry where um, the, 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 the the very different properties of organofluorine molecules were latched onto. So the freons that replaced ammonia refrigerants was much better from a safety standpoint. Non-stick pans, right, were, were seen as a, as a marvelous thing and, and, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago. Firefighter foams that could put out oil fires or fires on ships that that would have been devastating. Nonstick agents, um, cosmetics uh, they've been used. Um, even you know ski waxes. Um, so in fact, in the Olympics, right, all these uh, you know competitive skiers have used uh, perfluorinated ski waxes. I think they're going to be banned in the next Olympics. So now we'll be testing not only for drugs in the athletes, but uh, uh, PFAS on the on the skis, but but be, although you know some of these are being regulated, even banned, because of um, you know, properties now that's found in the environment or when people get exposed to them from environmental contact, there are some that that just they're 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 irreplaceable or or at least we we don't have good replacements now, so they're going to be used for the foreseeable future. And by the way, there's. There's about 9,000 commercial uh, applications of fluorinated compounds. Uh, most of the pesticides that have been approved in the last 20 years have fluorine in them. So, so it's pervasive. All right. So, you know, what are people doing? And, and, and you know, maybe what's the involvement of this community? Well, one thing 
is um, basically in getting biology to interact with fluorine in a way that maybe helps deal with some of these problems. This is a group that um, uh, in Europe that uh, is a, a major group that's tackling uh, looking at fluorine incorporation to make fluoropolymers and and the precursors to them, uh, Pablo Nickel um, he he I think uh, spoke in this series um, a, a few years ago, um, so so he's one of the key actors in uh, in in this group. So this is one really ongoing effort of of sort of now trying to to see how how biological systems can interact with fluorine in a productive way. Um, to, to deal with societal problems. Another way that, that fluorine is, has been of interest in, the, um, uh, in, in this uh, build-a-cell community is early efforts to expand the genetic code latched onto fluorine and, and using fluorinated amino acids to try to get those to incorporate and replace other amino acids. And the, the most... Um, seemingly tractable one was fluoro, uh, fluorotryptophan, right? So, so in this case, the, the indole ring of, of tryptophan is fluorinated. And so in that way, right, uh, uh, because tryptophan is usually not directly involved in, in the chemistry the, the, you know, of enzymes directly, and it's more in hydrophobic core. And, and so this fluorine was thought, well, this probably wouldn't impact this kind of folding. It's, uh, fluorine is small. It's it's uh, would this would still be a hydrophobic uh, molecule, but it turns out it was very difficult. Uh, and and so this here's one example of a of a paper that came out a couple of years ago. Um, but but um, this has been more uh, talking to people who have done this. It's it's been more difficult than than they considered to get even one fluorine, you know, on a molecule getting incorporated where, where the perturbation would seem to be fairly minor. Now, what we decided was to actually do something, you know, in a way a little bolder or seemingly bolder in that we wanted to get bacteria to consume and completely rely on fluorinated compounds. So to, to eat them and to grade them. So this is this really, in a way, um, there's two problems. One of they're using the fluorinated compound in the first place. And then the other one is to deal with the fluoride that's released, because I'm going to show you the reason that that there's so little fluorine in biological systems is, is, is biology has evolved ways to get fluorine out when it gets inside the cell. And I'm, and I'm going to come to that in, in a few more slides. But first, this approach, you know, just very broadly conceptually, right, is, is you know, one of the, the fundamentals of biology, right, is one cell going to two cells, right? That's when you have a living system. And I think this was captured just, you know, simply and, and elegantly. I'm sure many of you have seen this quote by um, uh, Jacob. Um, who stated that the dream of a bacterium is to become two bacteria. And um, very, very simple, but so, so our concept was to now uh, set up a system where, where bacteria would rely or be addicted to the fluorinated compound. They'd have to use it in order to divide, right? So, and then even if it's very poor, even if it's slow or it's, there's toxicity, then cells would solve the problem themselves, right? Because these flu highly fluorinated compounds haven't been around, nature hasn't really, evolution hasn't really had the opportunity to kick in and, and to solve the problems like they have with the other industrial chemicals that resemble natural products. There's all that evolution over millions of years to, to sort of build on. Now we have to deal of with thinking of creative ways, new systems, new evolution in order to, to get this to, to work. So again, um, so I, in my introduction, I didn't say that uh, before I even went to graduate school, I started, I was, in, I was working as an analytical chemist. And one of the things I learned from that, uh, a, long, a lifelong lesson, was to always get your analytical uh, methods in place before you really tackle a, a major problem. And this is uh, clearly a major problem. So um, actually my, my first graduate student working on this, um, uh, this area of uh, degrading fluorinated compounds 
uh, she took on that problem. And and what uh, her name was Maddie Bigged. And, and what she what Manny did was to take this um, uh, drinking water test. So so this uh, chemical structure in the upper left is a uh, chelate structure of lanthanum. And um, it's actually pretty amazing because in 55 molar water, fluoride will bind so tightly to the lanthanum that it, it will displace water. And uh, when it does so, it undergoes this color change from a red to a, to a blue or purple hue. And uh, so this is something that you can, I mean, in drinking water, it was often used as a spot test. Um, of course, you know, we take, take uh, pictures of plates, but we, Maddie developed it for a micro or well plate format and was able then to develop it. And, and this is, uh, you know, we, it's very sensitive. We can detect nanomoles of fluoride. So overall, probably in her graduate work, and uh, she was a master's student, Maddie um, screened, I'd say, well over 100,000 um, combinations of, of uh, systems and or, or cells and, and fluorinated compounds and, and got uh, you know, quite a number that were enough that turned blue that we, uh, we were heartened to continue this work. And so I'm not going to tell you about some of that other early work, you know, finding organisms, but I do want to tell you about then our, our next sort of question and hurdle. We we had analytical, we we found it worked, uh, we could use it to screen biological systems, you know, existing biological systems that could do and and I can tell you as we investigated these, these were these are systems that had not evolved to specifically work on fluorinated compounds. It was adventitious or accidental. It was basically reactions or chemistries that had developed for other purposes that in a sense uh, were co-opted. But because it was being co-opted, we had to get the cells to either express, you know, artificially or induce the previous, pre-induce the cells in order to get them to, to manifest that chemistry and, and, and release fluoride. So um, we 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 thought our next hurdle was to was to look at regulatory systems. Could we find regulators again that maybe evolved for other purposes, but but would uh, in fact serve to to uh, recognize fluorinated compounds and then turn on enzymes when they're needed? So um, first, I'm going to tell you about this uh, what's called Todd ST. So this is a a two component regulatory system that evolved in pseudomonas that grow on aromatic hydrocarbons. Aromatic hydrocarbons, right, are in crude oil. They're, they're ubiquitous in the environment. There are quite a number of bacteria that use these as carbon energy sources and make enzymes to do so, to, to break down and assimilate the carbon. And of course, they turn on the enzymes when they're uh, in the presence of, of these, these chemicals. So this shows you uh, it's it's a well studied system. It's in Pseudomonas butita F1. So this Todd S domain is the sensor domain. So that's what binds the hydrocarbons, and then working with another component, it will um, cause derepression and, and expression of an operon in this case to metabolize these these hydrocarbons. But you know there's there was a structure of Todd S and and with some modeling. We, we deduce that it might in fact bind some fluorinated compounds. And then that the this Todd uh, C1 and C2, we found that's induced, oxidize some chemicals and would release fluoride from those molecules. So this was combining now the induction with the, the defluorination chemistry. So again, we, we needed the analytical in place and there have been analytical methods or, or biologically based um, assays for, for determining the expression of this operon, specifically the C1 and C2 genes that make this oxygenase. But in fact, um, they relied on basically a series of reactions, uh, enzymatic reaction and then spontaneous chemistry that makes indigo. So that's the blue gene dye, right? It's a very intense color. So it's very sensitive. Um, so it's nice if you're cloning uh, an oxygenase gene into E. coli and you see you look for blue colonies, but but it was it was not fast. We wanted a direct readout, and so uh, Kelly 
uh, Akima in my lab, postdoc at the time, she recognized that along the pathway of this of this reaction cascade, that uh, indoxal forms very fast, and that's fluorescent. And she used this to develop this, this nice um, microtide or well-played fluorescent assay where you get an immediate readout. And using that then, uh, uh, working with Maddie and with Lombros, other work, co-workers in the lab, she determined that not only aromatic fluorinated compounds would induce, so this is, toluene is sort of the gold standard. Most other aromatic hydrocarbons only induce about 40 or 50% as much as toluene. So these fluorinated compounds were in line with other aromatic compounds. But interestingly, we found that other um, fluorinated aliphatic compounds, including some that resemble uh, some, some real environmental concern chemicals, will also upregulate the genes. So this might also have some value in terms of detecting these chemicals, but that's, that's another project um, for, for another day. So what I wanna go back to is this idea of evolution and, and basically selecting for new metabolism, right? We wanna be able to, to set up a system where the system can uh, divide, basically a cell can divide as a result of fluorinated uh, uh, breakdown chemistry. And then even if it's very poor, it, it should improve over time or we can, we can find ways to make it better and have a direct readout, a direct, direct selection. So you're, so really, you know, since Darwin, people have, you know, recognized the power of evolutionary selection. Uh, but of course, you know, in uh, what Darwin was looking at was the products of adaption over millions of years, right? And how um, uh, basically there were progenitors or, or organisms that um, uh, gave rise through, through mutation and adaption over long periods of time uh, to new, to new uh, properties and, and new living things, or at least what we consider to be different uh, living things. But the, the nice thing, of course, working with single cells with microorganisms is that we can see this adaption overnight, right? So uh, we work with a number of bacteria that divide in 20, 30, 40 minutes. Um, and, and so basically we can get a, a readout overnight if the cells are responding and growing and uh, if they're growing better just by looking at growth. So this is a tremendously powerful, of course, that many people have used. All right, so this is the system that we set up. So, so in this case, we took now, this is um, uh, a natural enzyme or at least a naturally evolved enzyme. So as I said, fluorine is rare in biology, but this is a rare case where um, certain plants have found a way to, to make fluoroacetate. Fluoroacetate is extremely toxic. It's, it's an analog of acetate that gets incorporated and basically shuts down the TCA cycle. So it shuts down energy metabolism. So it's a toxin produced by these plants. Um, probably it's been made for millions of years. And so people have found over the years, I think the first report was in 1960. So this has been known for some uh, quite some time that there are enzymes and a number of these have been have purified and studied that um, will displace the fluorine and replace it with a hydroxyl group. So we looked at sequences then and made alpha fold models because we were looking for ones that had a bigger active site that would accommodate substrates instead of just a hydrogen would, would work on a bigger group that we could then use as growth substrates for the bacteria. And so we, we found such a, uh, I'll show you an enzyme, we um, expressed it. And then of course, the idea was to put the gene into some place where there's complementary metabolism. We would get defluorination and the downstream products would allow uh, for carbon and energy for the cell. So we would be able to score cell growth as an indicator of defluorination. And, and we could look at the the readout basically of the uh, efficiency of growth as an efficiency of defluorination and adaption to the fluorinated compounds. So this enzyme was surprisingly active. This we looked at actually a, a couple, but this one on the right, um, this these activities of micromole per minute per milligram is is along the order of what you see for 
uh, general metabolic enzymes. So this is not its natural substrate, but yet it was uh, extremely active with it. Uh, so then the question is what bacterium will then, in this case, if you replace a floor, uh, displace a fluorine from the alpha position of this fluorophenylacetic acid, you make mendelic acid or hydroxyphenylacetic acid. So what bacteria will grow on that? And we also wanted to find, uh, have a bacterium that would also grow in the product of 2-fluoropropionic acid. And, and of course, at this time, we didn't know the stereo, th these are chiral molecules. So we would get the, there would be potential for one or both enantiomers being made in the products. And, and we didn't know at this point. So we put it in this organism that could handle both the S and R forms of mendelic acid. And uh, people usually use DNL for lactic acid. So I'll use those. DNL, lactic acid, there were enzymes in this bacterium that could handle these. So it was known to be able to grow on these as, as growth substrates. So we put the genes into this particular organism. And it turns out we did stereochemical determinations and we found out that in fact, the S um, enantiomers were converted to the R products. And then those um, in fact were taken on by the organism and used as growth substrates. So, so our, our fundamental sort of uh, setup uh, appeared to be working. So how does it grow? So that, that's the first interesting thing because although it grows very well on mandelic acid and um, it, it doesn't really like the, this as nearly as much and it's not due to limitations of the enzyme. We're finding that mandelic acid is getting, getting, getting provided at, a, at a, a, a sufficient rate to completely support growth. However, you, we see this big lag phase, right? So this is the reason this looks kind of strange as a growth curve is this was done uh, on a TCAN. So basically there's all these growth curves superimposed. I think there's 10 of each. And you can see that when fluoride is outside the cell, um, it's not so toxic because a little bit gets in, it's, it's maybe a little bit inhibited, but we attributed this to fluoride toxicity. And I'm gonna show you um, some further indications of that. One is if you if you give the cell the same substrate, the, the enzyme will also displace with a chlorine here. So that's gonna make chloride, which is of course cells use for ion balance. It's not uh, considered to be a toxic um, anion. And in that case, the enzyme's not so fast with chloride. So that's actually limiting, but you can see that it grows initially logarithmically, whereas it's now much more um, depressed with the growth on the fluorinated compound. So that's the first indicator that the fluoride was, was causing um, the problem. Now to go back to this, this slide that I showed you previously, right? Cells do not, um, bacterial cells that have been looked at, do, do, the people don't find fluorine in them, even though they're, they're there's lots of fluorine uh, in the Earth's crust. So there's an explanation for this. So um, there's groups that have studied fluoride stress and fluoride exposure uh, to, to living cells. So this shows you, um, this summarizes uh, you know, a lot of work by uh, a number of groups, but most fluoride geologists will tell you that most fluorine in the environment is not an organic fluorine, right? And I mean, until humans came along, but it's it's largely sequestered in, in minerals, right? So it's bound in with magnesium, sodium, calcium, right? So th th these are actually the, the elements that get, uh, or minerals that get mined in order to, the industry to make the PFAS chemicals. But now what happens in, in and this has happened over millions of years is that that of course water is always rushing by these, these flowing by these minerals. You get leaching or, or extraction of fluoride. Cells have been exposed to fluoride and especially when the pH is a little acidic, you get HF can, can readily get into the cells. It can cross membrane spontaneously very quickly. And fluoride then binds, you know, cells use calcium, magnesium and fluoride binds avidly. 
So there's ATPases, enolase, these essential enzymes that get shut down from fluoride. So what, so what organisms have evolved over, and this is probably millions of years because we see the diverse sequences in different organisms. Randy Stockbridge at Michigan has studied these extensively. The, these, these basically um, uh, are, are fluoride exporters. So these get in, induced when the cells expose to fluoride, it basically expels fluoride from the cells. Now, um, there's also other genes. Uh, so this is from the nickel lab, uh, this, this uh, uh, basically uh, chromosomal circle on the right is indicating genes that get upregulated under fluoride stress. So it's so it's a it's a pretty wide response. This has probably evolved under over millions of years, and um, it it allows cells to then um, survive when fluoride leaks in. Well, now what are we doing? We're making fluoride inside the cell where it's the most toxic. So so all of it is going inside the cell. And, and then all of it is um, basically causing problems uh, and, and cells have to work hard to get it out. So what so some other indicators of this stress. So if you plate the cells on these substrates, here it's on mendelic acid. This is a, these are uh, images or sections of agar plates. You see pretty good sized colonies. Here after seven days versus two days, they're much smaller. So they're they're stressed. They're also, if you if you just measure the amount of cell crop, the amount by OD, and we've also done this now by cell counts, um, you can see that there's less cell mass. For we're limiting the amount of substrate, and we're not getting as much cell mass. So what what's the explanation for that? Well, uh, a plausible explanation is that the cells are expending energy due to handle this fluoride stress, and that's limiting the amount of, of uh, energy that can go into making more cells, right? So they're, they're wasting, in a sense, energy that's not making more, more organisms, but it's, but it's dealing with the stress at hand. Um, here's another indicator on the left here. These are cells that are growing on mendelic acid during exponential phase, or if they're growing on rich media, they're these nice long rods. They're much shorter here uh, and, and look fragmented. We, we're, we're really interested in this phenomena. Why do they form these shortened cell types? Uh, you know, does this help them deal with the stress as well? But these are all sort of together signs of, of, this, um, uh, of, this, of this stress. So we've been able to achieve, though, even with the stress, the cells grow slowly. They're they're basically uh, wounded in, in in a sense, but but we've been able to get with with fluoropropionic acid um, up to fifty millimolar fluoride release. So so in in fact, even though um, uh, we're imposing a lot on on these cells, they they are um, doing a reasonable job in breaking down the chemicals. And and so so how do we how do we investigate the system further? How might we even improve it, both for the maybe maybe practical purposes, but also to learn more how cells can better respond? Because this situation, as far as we know, of dealing with these very fifty millimolar fluoride, we don't know that this has even ever happened in nature, where cells have had to do deal with this very high level of, of fluoride exposure. So, um, so now we're really we're we're trying to to push the system and see how they evolve, how they respond. So one simple thing that we're doing is just serial transfer. So a lot of people call this adapted evol adaptive evolution. Uh, Rich Lensky, right, has pioneered this for years. Uh, Bernard Paulson, others. Um, uh, have, have done some remarkable studies. This is not our work. This is from this publication and it was a nice slide. So I'm just, it's a good to illustrate the, the, the concept. And also it's with the Pseudomonas butita, which is well, a, a, a variant of a, of a strain we're working with. So in this case, their organism will grow on paracumeric acid or par paracumerate, but it's it's toxic, so you see a long lag phase. So so there's a nice parallel to ours, and they just do did serial transfers, and then they they found adaption, and then and then sequenced and did studies to determine what was the nature of the evolution, the adaption. 
So we're, we're doing similar things. And in fact, we were surprised at just how fast the system adapts. So in this case, the lag has gone from, you know, almost a day down to a couple hours. And even the really most interestingly, I think, is the final um, uh, optical density has gone up, which is sort of an indicator that maybe they're learning to deal with it even more efficiently, as well as being able to um, diminish the toxicity. So um, we're, we're investigating this further. Um, so in this case, we, we put in more. In this case, when they're unadapted, they really start choking when you get into these higher levels, whereas they seem to handle it much better uh, the, these adapted cells. So we're in the process now of sequencing. I don't have the answers um, to, to what the nature of the adaption is, but we think this is very exciting that, that cells can adapt to these fluorinated compounds um, pretty readily. Maybe it's uh, basically the right uh, selective pressures have never been imposed, and we need to uh, basically speed up evolution. Uh, I, I think the forever monitor is wrong. These chemicals are, are not, not completely non-biodegradable. They're very, very difficult to degrade. They're gonna be slow. And if we wait for natural evolution, it might take decades. Um, but uh, I think we can develop systems in the laboratory and basically in the process also understand how that, um, cells deal with this, this uh, basically element that they've largely ignored for for a long time. So, <clears throat> oh, by the way, um, this is actually the most recent experiment, uh, so I, I didn't even have it in mind, was, um, you know, just, just in the last week, um, while we're waiting for the sequence, we also did a simple experiment to just look at fluoride. And actually, when the cells are now picking up the adapted cells, are actually producing less fluoride per unit cell. Um, so this is the unadapted cells that haven't even started to grow yet, but, but the system is turned on, they're releasing fluoride, but the fluoride seems to be too damaging. So maybe one solution is to basically titrate uh, the level of resistance to fluoride with release of fluoride and getting that, getting that uh, at, at an optimum level. So, so again, this is something we're we're looking into further uh, to see what's the genetic or genomic basis of this. All right. So overall, um, we're we're looking at a number of systems. All of these are going to have to deal with fluoride stress, even more fluoride stress, because we're working uh, helping with a bacterium that degrades this highly fluorinated molecule or this one, but with another lab, um, as well as other projects in my lab where we're um, going to have to deal with both fluoride toxicity, and we're very interested in the enzyme systems that uh, that do the metabolism. And this is, I think uh, this is from a, a slide that, that Francis Arnold gave me, just this idea that, uh, uh, you know, all you need to find is something that works. And <clears throat> it might be suboptimal in our case for defluorination, but if you get it, you, you find it, and you get a bacterium to grow, you can you can really climb up the ladder and and increase the system and get it to work better. All right, so um, uh, just I want to I've highlighted Maddie who got this project and Kelly, but also Serena Robinson who did some a lot of initial bioinformatics now in Switzerland. Lombros just uh, did some modeling. He just recently graduated. Tony, uh, Cal, Marie, Jack, Maddie are, are continuing to work on um, fluorinated compounds. And then our collaborators at Riverside, Princeton, and at Minnesota. And um, with that, I'll just um, go to this slide and um, be happy to, to answer questions. Maybe um, you can ask me. I'll also open the chat and, and see if there's questions that, that came up along the way. Thank you so much, Larry. Um, there's several questions in chat. Yes, let me go to the, here, I'll start at the top here. Okay. Um, uh, could we engineer proteins with fluorine side chains translating natural amino acids? Would that enable any new catalytic or other activity? 
So in fact, there, um, I didn't go into it, but there, there are a very small number of natural fluorinated compounds. They're only monofluorinated. There is, um, I believe it's fluorotyrosine. And I think there's another fluorinated amino acid that gets made naturally. There's also a fluoride, uh, a fluorine containing nucleoside mimic that's actually of interest as an antiviral. Um, <clears throat> so, so yeah, so, the, you know, that would be maybe a, um, uh, because these are toxins, right? So what, what they do is they, just like fluoroacetate, they're made to mimic a, a naturally occurring compound, a metabolic um, uh, common intermediate. It incorporates and then it basically blows up the, the metabolism or the proteins don't work. Um, so one could use that as a selection, right? If you had detoxification, right? Um, um, and and so I think that that could be could be used and there could be natural enzymes that evolved to handle those, to detox for fluoro, um, uh, tyrosine, I mean, I guess it was, no, it's uh, fluorothreonine, I think it was. I, I'm not aware of anyone who's found naturally occurring enzymes that work on that, but that's, that's possible. So if, if there's any follow-up, happy to go into that. All right, so the next question is when plants make toxic fluorine compound that shuts down TCA cycle, how does it not self-poison the self that makes it? Very good question. So um, I don't know so much about the plants, but I, I didn't mention it, but there are a few streptomyces that also make fluoroacetate. And so that's actually been looked into. And the streptomyces, what they do, I mean, streptomyces, as you know, are uh, many of them make, make useful antibiotics, right? So this is an antimicrobial. It's not used clinically. It's just way too toxic and, and it's not useful that way. But <clears throat> what they do is they grow. So they, they reproduce, they, they have active metabolism. And then what they do, they shut down metabolism, most metabolism, the TCA cycle, and then start making their natural products, in this case, fluoroacetate and excrete it. So they have a period of active growth, shut down active growth, and then kill off their competitors. So that seems to be the way that they, at least the bacteria, have evolved to not kill themselves. Now, plants, I don't know. They must compartmentalize it some way since plants are multicellular. Um, there, there's some analogous systems where plants make toxins and they compartmentalize it only when the animal sort of chomps on it, that then they get the toxin. So I'm, I'm suspecting it's something like that, but I don't, I don't really know from firsthand, but it might be known. Um, another question, are there any extremophiles that have notably increased fluorine, uh, tolerance? I don't know. Um, uh, you know, we have, you know, we're beginning to look at the distribution of these fluoride exporters. Um, actually, I'm working with Randy Stockbridge, who's really the expert on that. Um, and, um, you know, I they are they are found in other bacteria. I mean, and as well as archaea. And um, uh, I, but I don't know. I, you know, I haven't looked to see if they're in you know, say bacteria that extremophiles that grow at higher temperature under other conditions to see if they might be more or less or or different type. So so that's an interesting question. But um, I guess I'd have to say your second question is it something that hasn't been looked at closely? I think it's the latter. But it's uh, it's an interesting question. All right. Um, how did we end up with fluorine on our teeth? Ah, good question. So, so it turns out that a lot of water systems put fluoride in water. Now, this is really um, interesting because yes, fluoride is toxic and it's the reason there's fluoride in toothpaste too. So you brush your teeth, you're getting fluoride, a little bit of fluoride, but it's a very small amount. And it's one of the reasons I've been told by uh, someone at Procter & Gamble the reason they don't make toothpaste taste really good, like candy, 
is they don't want little kids eating like whole tubes of toothpaste because they get too much fluoride. So a little bit of fluoride is good. It actually goes into the, it makes fluorophosphate. It actually hardens your teeth. And it also, like some of the streptococcus that form biofilms on your teeth are killed by, they don't have good fluoride tolerance. So they're killed off at low levels um, and, and that prevents some biofilm formation. So, but, so a little bit is good, but anything, you know, getting into, in fact, there's water systems where there's naturally, you know, where there's like a lot of fluoride um, minerals, where basically people drink high fluorinated water and they have health problems from that. So the water treatment systems actually put put um, adsorbents in to absorb out the fluoride, or or there's there is serious consequences of high fluoride exposure. So uh, yeah, that's a good good question. Um, let's see. So to make your system as a bioremediation platform, what would be the remaining challenges to overcome for real world applications? So yeah, that's that's a really good question. So I think the now, I you know we this pseudomonas I think being able to handle up to fifty millimolar uh, fluoride, and and we're even maybe getting it pushing it up to higher levels. I think now maybe the the limiting step is going to be you know, chewing up some of these uh, really highly fluorinated chemicals, getting the right enzymes that will will work when there's multiple fluorines present um, and um, not producing toxic intermediates and so forth. So that's why we're working uh, both in our own labs and with some collaborators to try to um, find out these other systems that they're, they're may be very rare these, these enzyme systems that will work on these fluorinated compounds. So we need to ferret them out, try to find um, how to make them better, uh, faster. Uh, I think those are the those are the hurdles. And then are there, are there any other uh, verbal questions? I don't think so. I just wanna say, I really like your talk. Um, Good. As a chemist in me, that tickled the chemistry nerve that I don't exercise enough in the work that I'm doing right now. So that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I can say, you know, I'm in, in the process of, you know, just starting this project, you know, three years ago or so, you know, I've read a lot of papers in the Journal of Organic, you know, Journal of Fluorine Chemistry, because, you know, I've had to learn about, you know, fluorine is different, right? So fl fluorinated molecules have different properties. You can't just lump, I mean, if you, and some people make this mistake, they, you know, they basically say, oh, these enzymes that work with chlorine, bromine will work with fluorine. And that's not the case, right? Fluorine, it's the bond is much tighter. And there's a lot of different properties of fluorine because of its high, small size, high electronegativity. And that that's really why chemists have seized on them to make all of these unique products. But now, of course, you know, the the usual kind of thing, right? We we make a lot of things that are useful and interesting, and then we have to, you know, we find out later some of the problems and have to deal with them. Uh, but I but I think you know I'm hopeful that it's not insurmountable. But there there are things we can do to mitigate against bo both in in the biosynthesis arena as well as the biodegradation bioremediation side. Oh, Taysok uh, actually just made a very good comment. There's one more question oh, in okay. the chat. Okay. Oh, yeah. So let's see. Has horizontal gene transfer with pre-selected libraries of genes been applied simultaneously with adapted uh, selection? Would this be a useful approach? So, um, you know, we've done something similar to that. Similar, we, we took the... Um, the the library I'm trying to remember the name of the researcher in Japan who made a library of all the E. coli genes and and expressed them on a on a plasmid, and we we got this library and we um, we basically screened against a library of fluorinated compounds right so then if we got a hit we'd know exactly the gene that was and if we had a good screen right so we could take you know four thousand clones and screen them against you know a library of chemicals and do do uh, replicates and so forth. So we we did a artificial gene library, not a not a naturally occurring gene library, 
um, it was sort of disappointing. We 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 uh, E. coli genes were were not very good in in defluorination. Was was sort of the the short story, but I think yes, yeah, screening. Um, you know, maybe maybe natural libraries that you're making um, where where there's a lot of horizontal gene transfer or making artificial chromosomes with gene libraries from certain environments. Uh, I don't I'm not aware of anybody doing that, but I, I think that would be yeah, I think that would be a useful approach. So a lot to do. Thank you. That's a good place to be to say there's a lot to do. Uh, all right, uh, if there's no more questions, one last call for questions in text or by mouth. If there are none, I want to say thank you, Laurie, again, and have a great week, everyone. Okay, thank you. Yes, very, very Bye. glad. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> Thanks. Bye.